Good morning. It's a real blessing for me today because the topic in Colossians is the Christ hymn, and I'm not going to cover the whole hymn. I'm just doing two verses. But the essence of the Christian gospel is it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And today is my very wonderful privilege to preach Christ. I don't take this lightly. I take it with the utmost of seriousness because the glories and riches of Christ are described in words that help us understand him, but nothing that I say can do justice to the reality of our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read for you, if you want to turn to the text here, Colossians 1, 15 to 16. I'll start reading with verse 13, which we covered last week. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. All things are not only created through our Lord, but for our Lord. And to him we owe our worship and obedience. Paul described his ministry in Romans to bring about the obedience of the gospel. Christ is so important. If you think of the five solas, one of which is Christ alone, Paul, when he describes gospel preaching in Philippians 1.18, says, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. In fact, some were preaching Christ out of bad motives. But it's so important to Paul that Christ be preached that he could even rejoice if somebody preached Christ who really didn't have Paul's best interest in mind in his imprisonment. So when we talk about the gospel being preached, we can just as legitimately say Christ is preached. So today we look at the preeminence of Christ. But first, I want to do a little bit of reiteration because I did get a graphic to describe what we were talking about last week, the transfer from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his son. Now, as I said last week, I've written many articles over the last 22 years But the ones that I get the most feedback about are on the topic of spiritual warfare. I've dealt with the warfare worldview. I've contrasted that with the biblical worldview. I've talked about generational curses and how that's mistaught. I've talked about authorities and powers over cities and territories that are described and the various technologies that have arisen to deal with that, but here is a biblical understanding of conversion, that whether our life was cheerful and pleasant, prosperous and nice, or whether our life was obviously miserable and wretched just compared to other sinners, it doesn't matter Because without Christ, we're under the domain of darkness. That's how the Bible describes it. 
The darkness may appear to be worse or better, but it's still darkness. But when we come to Christ, we're transferred into the kingdom of Christ. And in that kingdom, we're still influenced. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one, but the Lord said in his prayer, rescue us from the evil one. We don't have to think like the world. We do not have to behave like the world. We do not have to have lives like the world. And the issue isn't attacking demons and spirits or whatever, because Christ is the head over all, including the hostile powers. And he is for the benefit of the church. Let me read to you, if you want to turn to this, Ephesians 1, beginning with verse 20. Ephesians 1, beginning with verse 20. Thank you, Adam, by the way, for teaching us this morning about Ephesians. It says here, he demonstrated this power in the Messiah, I'm in the Holman Christian Standard Bible, by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put everything under his feet and appointing, appointed him as head over all, everything for the church. Christ is head over all, including the hostile powers, for the benefit of the church. So my beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, when God saved you, he transferred you from one kingdom to another. And so if you have difficulties, we still live in a fallen world, but don't call the exorcist. Okay? Don't run off to the spiritual warfare seminar because there you will hear false teaching. We need to know that our status is totally different now because we're in Christ. Now... Let's go to the very beginning of the Christ hymn, one of the magnificent parts of the New Testament. I'm not going to spend time doing source criticism here. There's been a lot of theories about where this hymn came from, but we know it's in Colossians, and Paul is the author of Colossians. The first part of Colossians 1.15 says, He is the image of the invisible God. So the beginning of the Christ hymn extols the preeminence of Christ. That's our theme this morning, the preeminence of Christ. Christ reveals the unseen God to us. In the incarnation, Christ, who existed as God and with God from all eternity, came into this world and to us revealed God. Again, as I said last week, there's a lot of scripture here. You might want to jot some of this down and think about it and contemplate it more later. But I can't do justice to this if I don't give you the passages elsewhere in the New Testament that fill out this picture of the preeminence of Christ. One passage you need to know about is John 1 and verse 18. John 1 and verse 18. Let me read that to you. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Wow. So much scripture and so little time. And I will show you later today in this sermon that in eternity we'll be singing praises to the exalted Christ. Oh, yes. When we talk about the Christ hymn and Christ alone is one of the solas and our exalted and glorious Lord, we're addressing a topic that's an eternal topic. It's central to everything we are and everything we do. Christ alone. 
great song, in Christ alone. And so here in John 1.18, it says, No one's really seen God. That's affirmed in the Old and New Testament. But the only begotten God, Christ is God incarnate. Thus we see the deity of Christ, who's in the bosom of the Father. When I preach the gospel, I often cite John 1.1, 1, 1, who was with God face-to-face -face with God, and who is God, has explained him. Here's an interesting term in John 118. The term for explained, I was looking that up in the Greek, and it's the word where we get our term exegete. Exegeomai. Exegete. Some people that are mystics or some people that are hyper-spiritual in, in a charismatic sort of way used to say, exegesis means exit Jesus. Oh yeah, have you ever heard that one? Woe to the church that ex exegetes the scripture, Jesus will leave. But, when they say that, they show that they're ignorant of the scriptures that they're even talking about. Because here we see that Jesus Christ, the Son, exegetes God. Far from exiting. It is in Christ in whom we find our goal and purpose as those who are being conformed to his image. Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, is saving a people and conforming that people to his own image. There's no understanding of sanctification that can't at least deal with being imagers of God. And so, therefore, we need to take it seriously. We need to be like Jesus. Romans 8.29 says this, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. So all of us foreknown and predestined are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. This goes all the way back to Genesis, Genesis 1, 26, 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created a man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. So humans are created in the image of God. This is, okay, it's got to be on one page or the other here. Here it is. Sorry about that. I'm looking for my notes. If you want to take note, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 through 6. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 through 6. In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. You see, as we're preaching the gospel, we're aware of the fact that Satan blinds people's minds. Satan doesn't want people to see who Christ is. But Paul says that we preach Christ. It says in 2 Corinthians 4, 5, For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as bondservants for Christ's sake. It's really bad to preach ourselves. As one scholar I read said, the worst topic any preacher ever found 
self. But we preach Christ. Verse 6, 2 Corinthians 4, For God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. My dear friends, we preach Christ because that is the theme of God's redemptive history and of the gospel. And so therefore, his glory is revealed to us through the gospel. Then it goes on to St. Colossians 1.15, the firstborn over all creation. The firstborn over all creation. Now this has caused false teachers and cults a tool to use to deceive the flock. But we will not be deceived. Firstborn here doesn't mean he's the first created being because we affirm that Christ is eternal God. Non-contingent, eternal, not created. The creator, but not created. Here, the term firstborn doesn't mean the first in a line of created beings, but rather preeminent over the creation. Firstborn means preeminence, supremacy, or priority of rank, not being created. In Exodus 4.22, as you see here on my slide, Israel is called God's firstborn. It says in Psalm 89, 27, I shall make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. And then it says in Hebrews 1, 6, that when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. The firstborn existed as, from all eternity, as God and with God. He has preeminence over all. He's the creator of all. He's the object of worship, which no created being can be. And uh, when he appears in various places, particularly in the book of Revelation, he's loved and adored and worshiped. We need to worship Christ. We need to extol Christ. We need to understand that the purpose of God delivering us is that we would be worshipers who honor Christ and who are being conformed by him into his image. And so it's not wrong to say that we would want to be more like Jesus. That people would see us and be able to take note that we'd been with Christ, that we love him and can explain the gospel of Christ to those who ask about the hope that is within us. Now we go to Colossians 1.16. Here it says that he's the creator in very specific language. For everything was created by him. In heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible. In the ancient world, as they would think about this, it would be obvious to them that to have been created by Christ would mean to be lesser than him and subservient to him. The invisible realm invoked fear in the minds and hearts of many of the pagans because they feared bad fate especially in Asia Minor. But if everything was created by him, and he's the Lord of all, and he's the creator of all, and he's saved us, and he's transferred us into his kingdom, out of the realm of darkness, and we are complete in him, then, my dear friends, we are safe. We are safe from the hostile powers. You would not 
Uh, I mean, you would be amazed at the people that don't want to hear that. I get letters, emails, phone calls. <clears throat> well, I read your article and I don't like it. Well, what don't you like? Well, my life is all messed up, but I'm looking for somebody to break the curse. But if you're in Christ, you're not cursed, you're blessed. Well, I think what's going on is people think, if this, what, if this is what it's like to be blessed, I'm very disappointed. All right? Because they don't like certain circumstances. But here's the problem with that thinking. We're thinking like worldly people. Who has more money, who has more happiness, who has a better situation. But if we really understand blessing is to be in right relationship with God through Jesus Christ, to have the fruit of the Spirit, the love, joy, peace, and so forth. And the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The question we should ask is, do we have righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit? If we do, we're blessed. But see, they think if they go to the seminar, somebody will break the curse and their problems will go away. But that's not what it's saying here. Everything here, tapantas in the Greek, tapanta, means the all. It's used three times in a couple of verses. many times in the New Testament, and you can look this up, the all, and it means often in the translated all things, and it's quite literally true. Let me quote to you John 1 and verse 3. All things, the same word in the Greek or same phrase, came into being through him, and apart from him, Christ, Nothing came into being that has come into being. So the eternal God, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, created the all. Okay? All things. This is literal and it's comprehensive. And that's very important to us. Christ is God and has eternal, non-contingent existence. What's a contingency? Anybody ever buy or sell real estate? If you ever have, you've probably heard the terminology contingency, often to protect either the buyer or the seller against something going awry. Nothing is contingent about our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the great I am. Heaven and earth here is a merism, merismos, figure of speech, where a part is used for the whole. Heaven and earth would mean the entire universe and even the beings that exist within that universe. The all exists by his act of creation. And it matters now whether it's visible or invisible, spiritual or corporal, mineral or animal, it's all created by our Lord Jesus Christ. It says in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, the all in the Greek. And we exist for him. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, the all. And we exist through him. Very important. Get your little, however you do it, you have a little or a big computer I still have a big one. I don't have a little one. But you can look up the all. You can, you can follow the Greek phrase. And you'll find out how important it is in the New Testament. So he created the all. 
And it doesn't matter how you conceive of things, they're all contingent and created. Colossians 1.16, B, excuse me, i got to sound dignified. Colossians 1.16, B, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, just think of what might make up the all, the far-flung aspects of the universe. The stars, the moon, the planets, the galaxies, here on the earth, the spirits, the angels, people, animals, everything we can think of. The all was created through him and for him. All the universe is created for Christ, the preeminent creator. F.F. F. Bruce says this about Ephesians 1.10 that describe the, describes this. All things then, says Bruce, <laughs> excuse me, all things then, says Bruce, are to be summed up in Christ and presented as a coherent totality in him. One of the things I studied when I studied apologetics in seminary were these constants that one finds uh, in the creation that make life possible on the earth. And it's amazing. When you see these constants, these things have to be just like this and not some other way or we'd all be dead. It has to be lead you to believe that there's a creator and an intelligent creator who created with a purpose. That's what brought me to become a theist three months before I became a Christian. Sitting in a big lecture hall at Iowa State University studying organic chemistry. 300 students in this hall and the professor put on the overhead a heme molecule, H-E-M-E, -E, part of the blood that makes it possible for oxygen to be carried to the cells. And he was illustrating, excuse me, he was illustrating carbon-carbon bonding. And when he got this molecule on the board, he turned around and he said to us, if one carbon bond, which is an electronic bond between the carbon atoms, were different, we'd all be dead. Because this thing would not carry oxygen and then release it to the cells. He never said why he told us that. And I sat there, I remember the day, I remember where I was sitting, I remember the lecture hall and the students, and I thought to myself, evolution is a lie. God created us. That was more than the church would tell me. Soon thereafter, I became a Christian. So all things hold together have been created through him, for him, in an orderly whole that functions amazingly well, even given the fall. It says in Colossians 2.10, in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. So this creator of the universe, this non-contingent one, this glorious one, this powerful one, who, for whom all things were created for him has made us complete in him. I was witnessing to a person recently and I said, in fact, the question came up, what's Satan trying to do anyhow? And my answer was to keep 
at you and anybody else from serving Christ. Well, why does Christ want to be served? He is the creator, and all things were created for him. It's my duty and obligation to serve him, to worship him, to honor him, and to extol him. And therein, I find joy and blessing as a create part of the creation as a human created in his image. Douglas Moo cites F.F. F. Bruce as well. He says this, the vision of Christ in relationship to creation is thus comprehensive and reminds us that, and now he's quoting Bruce, for those who have been redeemed by Christ, the universe has no ultimate terrors. They know that their Redeemer is also the creator, ruler, and goal of all. If the goal of all things is Christ and if everything's created by him and for him, then Christ alone makes all the sense in the world. I notice on our website, on the very front page, are the five solas, one of which is Christ alone. And that's certainly appropriate if you know anything about what we're talking about here. Bringing everything together in the Messiah, both things in heaven and things on earth, in him. Now I have some implications and applications. Number one, we must honor and worship Christ as the supreme creator. Number two, we must not fear fallen angels nor personally engage them. Don't go back to the realm God transferred you out of and try to do business there. That's the pagan worldview. Number three, as created image bearers, we must seek to be conformed to the image of Christ. Yes, dear beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, we're here to be created and recreated as new creatures to be conformed to the image of Christ. Now we're going to go into the book of Revelation and look ahead a little bit. You know, we get consumed with so many things here, and I realize they're important. It's very difficult to know how we're going to pay our bills, how we're going to be staying healthy as we get older and the world is in chaos we see things falling apart all around us eternity is a very very long time incomprehensible amount of time and so i'm thinking that in eternity we're going to be worshiping Christ. And if someone today thinks, well, can't we think of something more appropriate than worshiping Christ? Well, what do you think you're going to do in eternity? Are you going to get bored with our Lord? Are you going to say, can't somebody come up with a better topic than this? I hope we're not thinking that way. If you look at the Christian agenda in many cases there's very little about the supremacy of Christ Revelation 7 9 and 10 after this I looked and there was a vast multitude from every nation tribe people and language which no one could number are you thinking of the promises to Abraham in Genesis standing before the throne and before the Lamb, reminding us, by the way, the Lamb reminds us of the sacrifice that he made for us. They were robed in white with palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God 
who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. Can we sing a song like that? Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. They're singing about the Lamb of God in eternity. They're singing about salvation. They're being reminded of what he's done for us. And is it wrong that we would preach these things now? Absolutely not. Paul rejoiced if Christ is proclaimed. If you can get someone who doesn't really want to do it, but has a big audience, and you can convince them to preach Christ, it would be a great benefit to so many people. As I was on a plane going out to California to meet with Rick Warren, I thought about what I'm going to say, and I knew what it had to be. Preach Christ. Here's a huge audience. Preach Christ. I don't think, I think it fell on deaf ears. But whoever we may be, if we have an audience, by whatever means, don't you think that God wants us to preach Christ? Do you think these people in eternity are all wasting their eternal time because they got so much of it? Or do they really love Christ? Is he their all in all? Is that true now? Are our hearts aflame out of love and worship for the one who saved us and shed his blood for us? The vast number of the redeemed are worshiping Christ. We owe our salvation to God alone. Again in Revelation, this time chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Again, here's a little snippet, a little foretaste, a little glance into heaven and what's happening and what they're thinking about and what they're worshiping and what they're reminding themselves about. And it's the blood atonement. My, what's happened to the Christian agenda? What comes out of the pulpits? When I was a young man, I remember sitting in church and there were two pulpits in this church, one on one side of the front and the one on the other and there was a great big bible on one side and the preacher would open it and read something from there close that and then some more things happened in the liturgy and then he came over to the other pulpit that would be on my right his left as you look up there and I was probably 10 11 12 years old and I'd been there all my life and when he got over to the one from which we heard the sermon. He opened up the Reader's Digest, U.S. News and World Report, or Time Magazine, or an interesting, yeah, that great powerful spiritual work, right? And we heard about how to be better people. And later I began thinking, Well, if all this is about me being a better person, I think I can do that without religion. What a waste. Why are there churches? Why are there pews? Why are there podiums and pulpits? And if we're going to spend eternity being reminded that Christ was slain and purchased for God with his blood, people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation wouldn't we be seriously remiss if we didn't preach Christ now? Is there something else we should be thinking about besides Christ? I can't think of it. I don't want to. You see, my dear friends, 
The gospel is the gospel of Christ. And you say, well, what does that mean? The gospel that comes from Christ or the gospel about Christ? Yes. We must honor Christ because of who he is and what he's done. Let me quote to you from Acts and I'll preach the gospel to you. Acts 4, Peter had his chance and it says, Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit and said to them, Rulers and elders of the people. Verse 11. He is the stone which was rejected by you. They're convicted of their sin. The builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. Verse 12, Acts 4. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Oh, they didn't tell me that in a liberal church. The irony of ironies, I went off to Iowa State, and I was convinced by science that God created the world out of nothing, which was more than the church was willing to tell me. I don't want that to happen here. God created the world out of nothing, and all the evidence points to that. I've already told you about Christ as the pre-existent one. I told you about Christ as the creator. I told you about Christ as the image bearer of God who is recreating us into the image of God. Let me tell you some more. When it says here that he was slain, a lot of people are slain, but only Jesus Christ was sinless who was slain as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, who as the preeminent creator came into this world and allowed himself to be mocked and abused by wicked, sinful men. What did Peter say? He was rejected by you, the builders. But God raised him up and gave him life, resurrected from the dead, and declared him to be Lord in Christ, and called for everyone everywhere to repent. That's the gospel. We see, there is a heaven and there is a hell, and if we don't worship Christ for who he is, and we mock him and blaspheme his name with our words, what shall become of us in eternity? We shall be consigned to the lake of fire. But if we repent and believe the gospel, we turn to him now, grieved in our heart about our own sin, our own callousness toward Christ, and become worshipers, we shall be with him for all eternity. There's the gospel. No other name is given under heaven by which we must be saved. I thank God that in July of 1971, I met the Lord, Jesus Christ, as my Lord and Savior. What about you? Have you turned to the Lord Jesus? Repent. Believe the gospel. You can wash away our sin. We've broken God's law in every imaginable way. I heard it said that so-and-so had broken 11 of the Ten Commandments. <laughs> That's bad. But God can wash away that much sin and bring us to himself. Repent and believe the gospel. You know, this is a chance today as we worship him to start practicing for heaven, worshiping Christ alone the preeminent one. Now I want to talk about this spiritual warfare. It's amazing how this deceives people. They don't want to give up their pagan worldview. Remember we were talking about being transferred into the kingdom of his son? Now let me, excuse me, let me bring you to Jude 1 and verse 8 through 10a. And it shows here 
that we need to leave to the Lord the things that are the Lord's. We don't realize that we're mocking Christ when we try to take from him what's only his. It says in Jude 1, 8, Yet in the same way these men also by dreaming defile the flesh, reject authority, revile angelic majesties. The context proves it's bad ones. But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these men revile things they do not understand. How many times have I seen at meetings, so when I, especially when I was back in this movement in the 70s, people reviling against Satan or reviling against spirits over cities or binding the devil, and they think that their words are going to rearrange the cosmic furniture, and they don't realize that they're making themselves an affront to Christ, who alone rules over these beings. We need to regain a biblical worldview. It's not our place to rule over or interact with the fallen angels who must answer to the Lord. And so one, some will say to me, well, if you believe in this providential worldview that God's in charge of his own creation, then isn't God responsible for evil? If God is in charge of these things, why doesn't he wipe out all evil right now? And, and uh, well, there's a time for these wicked beings to be cast into the pit, but it's not now. In the meantime, he's rescuing people from their domain into the kingdom of his son. One last passage, and it's a little preview for later in Colossians, chapter 3. And it says, And having put on the new self, who's being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Now the new self, now the old self, the new self. The old man, the new man. Now, I've done a bunch of research on this. It's interesting terminology. Some people who like a more formal baptism idea think that this is the kind of clothes they wore to baptism. In other words, they were baptized in certain clothes, and then they got a white robe to wear afterwards to symbolize their new life. But there's no evidence right within the text of that. Certainly an interesting idea. But we put on Christ, we've clothed ourselves with Christ. The old Adam was the, is Adam. And uh, let me again quote F.F. F. Bruce. He says, the last Adam, or new man, that is to say, is effectively Christ. So in Galatians 3.27, instead of telling his readers, as here, that they put on a new man, Paul says directly, as many as you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Bruce continues, to put on Christ is the necessary corollary of being in Christ. Dr. O'Brien in his commentary on Colossians says this, Christ is the new man whom the Colossians have put on. He is the second Adam, the head of of the new creation. So we put off the old Adam, the old man, the old sinful, rebellious sinner that we were in Adam. We put on new clothes, that of the last Adam, Jesus Christ, and we're new creatures in Christ. And for those who by faith have done so, what God is doing is renewing us into the image of the one who created us. Wow. I'm excited about Christ. For a little while there, I thought I'd be seeing him before now. But I'm still here with you, so I shall preach Christ. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad you want me here. 
And so uh, today we were privileged in the word itself to be brought face to face with one of the solas, and that being Christ alone. So when we sing that again in Christ alone, I hope that some of the ideas have been filled in and our mind is full of the doctrine of Christ, that we teach about him, admonish one another in Christ, encourage one another to be conformed to the image of Christ, that we might be more like the one who bought us and brought us to himself. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to look into these things which are so glorious and beyond what we can ever imagine or hope other than when you've chosen to reveal these things to us in your word. May we remind each other that we're here to be conformed to the image of your son, Jesus Christ. May that be more and more the case as we walk through this world. And may the gospel of your son be on our lips as we're calling the lost to come in to the kingdom of your beloved son. And we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand for the benediction. This time from the book of Hebrews in chapter 13, verse 29. Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, with the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip you with all that is good to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. Glory belongs to him forever and ever. Amen. I think you can see why I chose that benediction. God bless you. Have a good rest of your day.